And our guest this week is Dr. Kathleen Carter-Martinez, a diplomat with the American Academy of Experts in Traumatic Stress. Dr. Carter-Martinez is certified in both rape and sexual assault trauma. She specializes in helping people through traumatic events, lawsuit, and recovery. She is a faculty member of Berkeley College, as well as the author of Permission Granted, the journey from trauma to healing from rape, sexual assault, and emotional abuse. Thank you very much for being here with us. We appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. You sent lawmakers in Albany who were part of that public hearing on sexual harassment in the workplace a letter commending them for holding that hearing, the first in the state in nearly 30 years. How significant are these changes? Oh, they're very significant. It's been such a long time since there's been any change in the law. And as I noted in that letter for years in New York State, this had a big effect on people who have been abused, assaulted in the workplace, and what resources they have, if they have any. Now, they will have resources, and they'll be, they'll be changing the system that allows people to report when they've had an incident and to get assistance in a manner that they feel safe and not assaulted again, which is often the experience of people when they do come out to say that they've had an event. The changes eliminate the severe or pervasive standard for proving harassment, which for years have allowed judges to dismiss claims of inappropriate comments or groping as, as being insufficient, not hostile enough to, to uh, be legitimate claims. It also expands the time frame to file complaints about workplace harassment. And this is something that you point out in your book, that there really is no set time that people who are traumatized will decide that it's time. It's time to come forward and it's time to speak up. That's very true and it's an, on an individual basis. The length of time between when the event happened and a person should decide to come forward to try to talk about it can be what seems to be like a lifetime. There's a lot of reasons for that but each person who chooses to do that does it in their own time and it has a lot to do with how they are feeling where they are in terms of recognizing what happened to them. There should not be a time limit because personal traumatic events are very different than other forms of trauma. They are uniquely individual. It is probably the only form of trauma where the person who has ex had the experience is the only witness to what happened. So if you are the only witness to your own personal traumatic event, it's very frightening to want to talk about it and to say, to assume that people might believe you. Now, obviously, the way um, the New York system was set up before, the message was, number one, don't say anything. Number two, if you do, you probably shouldn't. And number three, go away. So why would you? Why would you? So having an open time frame is far more conducive with respect to an individual's healing process. They may be further along in the healing process and feel, you know what, okay, now I can say this, where earlier on they could not. Much of the push for these changes comes from the Me Too movement. Along with giving victims more time to press charges, has it helped empower more women, giving them the courage to speak up? I think it's been very significant with respect to a lot of people now who come forward and feel like they can. And one of the reasons is because that is, in a sense, a group effort of people coming together that say, I've had this experience, you've had this experience, maybe not the same, but similar. So there's a safety, a safety feature there. But we can't forget the, the initial group of women who did come forward and started this movement on its first step. And that is what they call the Cosby women, the 35 women of the Sorrowful Sisterhood. And that is the name that they gave themselves. Mm -hmm. They were on the front cover of the July 2015 New York Magazine. It's 35 women who had a similar experience with Bill Cosby. At the end of that study and numerous court cases, it turns out there's probably at least 60 women who have had a sexual assault incident with Bill Cosby. However, only one of them held up in court most of them had run out of time, had run out of time to statute of limitations and had no recourse, no remedy at all. Did it inspire you to write 
the book, to follow through writing the book with what was happening in, in Pennsylvania? I was already writing the book. I was probably midway through when that finally came out and in the news and people were paying attention. I think that's the difference. It was the first time and maybe the first time that people actually started paying attention that something was actually happening. And that was very intriguing because we have generations where no one paid attention. And it, it became of interest because it was a public figure. That is something that is amazing if you think about it because they were able to see a pattern by studying the women individually first and then bringing them together which was the first time for those 35 women and many of them carrying this around for 10, 20, 25 years to actually talk to someone else about it. So if that's their first opportunity, if that's their first opportunity to talk about it, and it's 20 years ago, the conversation is, well, why is she doing it now? Why is she saying it now? The social constructs and the zeitgeist of the times, I love that word, but zeitgeist of the times really explains why things are the way they are, say, no, you cannot talk about this, and now we're with a group of women who are, are talking about it. Well, so maybe that is your moment. It's unfortunate that the legal system says statute of limitations 20 years ago, too bad. And that's very sad, and that's why it matters what New York has done. I absolutely think we need to give so much credit to the 35 women of the Sorrowful Sisterhood. I, they were phenomenally brave women. They still are. They you dedicated still. your book to them. I did because it was unheard of. It was unheard of, and you know, at the end of the day, you always, someday you figure no one's going to even know I wrote this book, you know, somebody will pick it up somewhere. And I thought, if you pick it up 20 years from now, I want you to know who are the women who inspired this. And in retrospect now, because we have hashtag me too, no more, several other ones, I don't think we should forget them. I think they stepped forward when no one else did. And I think they set the stage for the conversation that changes the social constructs. And the only thing that will change that is conversation and changing the dialogue. And they started the conversation. What inspired you to start the book? So in my early career, I worked in hospitals and radiology, and I encountered women in the ER who were harmed physically in some fashion from a rape or sexual assault. So that was like my first interaction with women and I very much liked working with them and helping them and then as I changed my career and my education I went into crisis in the emergency room so I started seeing like the same person but in a different capacity and in a different setting and when you see that you see the differences in terms of how they're being treated are their needs being met what do they need is there anything else we can do and then you start to see what's not happening. And as I started working in counseling in different settings, I started doing my own work and my own treatment models with them. And I was determined at some point that I would write my own, my own story, not because it's a story, but because it's a different perspective on what this experience is like for people. And the story goes beyond the event. And I think that's what's unique. You have been raped. You have been a sexual assault victim. To stand up with others and acknowledge that is takes so much courage, so much courage. But what happens when it's quiet all of a sudden and you're alone? If people choose to say, I am um, a rape victim, a sexual assault victim, if that's how they see it and that's how they feel it, that's what they are. But to make that choice is in effect to say, the event is still going on, it's not over yet. But if that's how they feel, that's how they feel. Some people might want to know there's another choice. Some people might go and say, this sounds good to me. I am a victim of rape. I am a victim of sexual assault. That implies, absolutely, that there has been an event. There has been a traumatic event, a personal traumatic event, but it's over. And then we have some people, and I have met these people, who look at you and say, don't call me a survivor. Don't call me a victim. Don't say that. I am not that. And I have worked with many people who see themselves as having had a traumatic event 
and are now in the healing process, which they see as a recovery process, a lifelong recovery process. But we stop there. And I always say, what about the women? Like, what now? We need to talk more about where they are now, what is possible. And that's a conversation that I think probably socially is still young, because we do need to start the conversation about when you have been traumatized, when you have had a personal traumatic event, how do we do that? What ways are available to you? How can we help you on that journey to healing? And I think it's a very realistic perspective to say that um, it is a lifelong journey.